Welcome everyone to the second in our webinar series uh, about manufacturing uh, sustainability. Um, this particular webinar is about identifying and eliminating waste. Um, and uh, what you're going to hear about is uh, how it's possible to generate additional value for businesses um, whilst at the same time reducing waste and increasing profitability, uh, all of which is also, very importantly, creating a sustainable future for ourselves and future generations. Uh, so the agenda for today um, is, uh, first of all, Professor Steve Evans, who is the, um, who is the uh, Director of Research at the Centre for Industrial Sustainability, will give you uh, an introductory view on, on the power of waste um, and uh, why um, every business should be uh, really paying attention to the value that waste provides to their businesses. Um, we'll then move on to Dr. Daniel Somerbell, one of our senior researchers, um, and he will be talking through how he has used uh, company data with companies in order to find uh, and find waste and uh, en enable them to understand the value that they can generate once they understand what they have. And, uh, uh, and finally, we'll hear from um, Gary Punter, uh, who is a senior industrial fellow uh, here at the Institute. Um, and he has extensive experience uh, from his previous um, uh, previous employment at AB Sugar, where he was uh, global head of, um, uh, of, of technology, and, and he will be uh, talking about how to get people involved and interested and engaged in the process that's needed in order to, uh, to, to get these sort of programs to be effective for us. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to uh, Professor Steve Evans um, to talk about the power of waste. Could you forward this slide for me again? Thank you. Yeah, done. And again, welcome everyone. 260 people signed up for this. Uh, either lockdown is driving you nuts and you're just picking up on random events or you're a serious nerd on waste. So you already understand why we need to tackle this. So in many ways, I'm reiterating a point that probably something behind the work that you already do anyway. For those people who don't understand the value of waste, they probably haven't joined this particular webinar. For those of you who do, it's interesting to ask how far we can go with this. How efficient can we be with existing technology? We've asked, and as researchers, we ask that big question. Today, we're specifically going to be exploring one or two tools and techniques that work, and then going on to explore the practices of good implementation that we know work. They're not the only ones, but they're a good taster. And if you want to know more, then come and talk to us more. So the research at the Centre for Industrial Sustainability covers efficiency and value. We'll come to that. For those of you who are value nerds as well, we welcome you to the next webinar in the series. Of course, we also study technology and how all of these three things come together in a system, but that's for later conversations. Next one, please. Interesting question, uh, you know, people like us, we do have nerdy questions. How much water does it take to make one pair of jeans? Next slide. We've managed to get it down to one litre from 800. I'd just like to let you imagine what that journey was like for a minute. When we started working with this particular jeans factory, it took 800 litres of water to make one pair of jeans. If we had set a target of even 100 litres, it would have been seen as impossible. But this journey was begun by this particular factory some time ago, and they've been on this journey, relentless, relentless, continuous, continuous, 
and eventually they reached a goal of using less than one liter of water to make one pair of jeans a quite fantastic achievement and today we want to talk to you about the sort of tools and techniques that get you on that journey that give you the skills the knowledge that helps you keep on improving so you get off to a good start and then you keep pushing next slide now i'd like to hand over to daniel who's going to talk about some specific tools and techniques that companies like that jeans company and others that we've worked with are using to identify and eliminate waste thank you super thank you steve so my name's Dan Somerbell. Um, prior to joining the Center for Industrial Sustainability as a researcher, I spent eight years working in continuous improvement across a very broad range of industries, everything from cement to cheese making uh, across North America and, and in Europe. And the reason that I came back to, to CIS was that I wanted to take some of the unifying themes and the techniques I'd seen help drive productivity improvement across these industries and see how we could leverage those to improve the sustainability of industry in the UK, Europe and beyond. Many factories have different definitions of waste. A lot of them look at what they put in the bin. Um, and in fact, if that bin is a recycling bin, sometimes that waste isn't counted, even though there are large both financial and environmental downgrades associated with putting something into the recycling stream. Now, there have been uh, many attempts to look at waste in other ways. Perhaps one of the most famous is, of course, uh, oh, I'm sorry, thank you, is, of course, lean, um, where you don't just look at material waste, you don't look at what's in the bin, but you look at all kinds of different waste across the factory and different types of waste thinking beyond the idea of just the material looking at everything from inventory to wasted time and motion but of course that generates quite hard to solve trade-offs one example is, is the one that i've seen uh, taking students around a car plant in the uk is this plant had put in a huge amount of effort to reduce the inventory waste in its rivet guns and they had these very short uh, just-in-time delivery method for its rivet inventory. But you look at the factory and every two minutes you're having to dodge a forklift truck as it dashes around bringing rivets to the machines that need them. Is that efficient? Has it reduced waste? Has it increased waste? It's hard to tell. And so we've been working on one uh, way of analyzing waste that tries to put this into context of the process as a whole. And in a fundamental sense, this compares two important or the two most important metrics that a factory manager has. How much raw material they're buying, how much they have to pay for, and how much they're being paid for in the form of useful product and so it's a simple idea but of course the key challenge there is how do you get the data just as with any um, waste analysis program it's not always easy to put the numbers behind it and we've tried to develop a technique that uses existing factory data things like invoices bills of materials rather than having to put in place an expensive monitoring system or do lots of line studies that only give you a snapshot picture and the key outcome of this technique is that it puts every source of waste into the context of the whole production system by comparing the real world to the ideal world where you only buy just enough material to make the useful products that's going out to your customer. And that way, if let's say you're seeing that the amount of loss and the amount of waste associated with your recycling process is very large, you can focus your improvement there. But in fact, if that downgrade is small compared to your inventory costs, you're going to focus on your inventory instead. And so it helps focus and target improvement in a way that drives 
value and drives enthusiasm from the workforce. And I know Gary is going to take us through some examples of that. So we've applied this technique in, in a range of factories and I wanted to share a few uh, case studies with you. Um, the first of these was a plastic extrusion process. So these guys are making uh, coffee capsules. Um, these capsules consist of a cup and a plastic lid and they're made on quite a sophisticated machine that has a 1% reject rate. And so this factory's initial estimate of their waste was based on what they were seeing coming off this reject rate. And so they thought they had a 99% yield because they had 1% waste. But when you looked at this in a zero loss sense compared perfect to what was actually happening, the waste was 14 times that. And it uncovered this very simple approach, uncovered all kinds of underlying problems within the factory. For example, the factory produced 14 million capsules last year, but 16 million lids. So there was this imbalance in the production system that just hadn't been picked up, but was picked up immediately once you look at the waste in a more fundamental way. 60 tons of their raw material had been put on hold, so it hadn't yet gone in the bin, but it also wasn't being dealt with because the company had changed supplier. We also took a look at a very different process, one that was making steel parts. Now, in, in, in metal parts processes, of course, you do expect a certain amount of waste because there's only so close you can have your parts together in a steel sheet before punching them out of that sheet would damage it. And for, a, you know, if you're doing a decent job on that, you should get about an 80% yield. And this factory thought that they were doing a decent job on that. So their estimate of their yield was about 80%. Looking at it in a zero loss sense, their yield was only 34%. A large amount of that was going into inventory. So they were building up stocks of raw material that weren't necessarily going to be used in the long term because they have a very fast turnover of the, the parts they make. And also, even though they were making a thousand different SKUs, a third of their losses were associated with only five products on five material codes. So looking at the waste in this way and breaking it down showed that actually focusing on those five products would give a good return on investment and gave them somewhere that they could focus improving their rework and improving their nesting processes that were driving these losses. You'll see that the two examples I've given so far are very much value driven. And I think one of the, the key takeaways here is that improving sustainability and reducing waste is also a way of driving value in the factory. But it can also apply to a much more directly sustainable uh, or to a much more directly sustainability focused goal, as this next example shows you. This is a concrete products process. Um, they're making piles and, and beams. Um, and this company was working with with some students, actually, with a goal of reducing their total CO2 footprint across all of their operations by 10 percent. The zero loss yield associated with their cement consumption alone accounted for 23% of their emissions just in the cement that they were buying but that wasn't going into useful products to their customers. So it shows you their initial focus was on doing things like investing huge amounts of money in renewable energy, electrifying their diesel powered fleet to try and reduce emissions at source, these guys were investing huge amounts of money and huge amounts of enthusiasm into improving their process. But taking a step back and looking at this waste in a more fundamental way, helped them focus that effort on an area that could have a much larger return on the considerable investment they were willing to make. So it won't be news to many of you that seeing waste not just looking at what goes in the bin is an important part of waste identification. But without putting a value on that, it's not only hard to build a case for action in a business case sense, it's really hard to get the team on board and get your employees on board. And Gary in, in the next section is gonna take us through a little bit more of the, the human side and the management side 
but having a number and saying guys this matters it's worth a lot is one of the steps that can take you towards doing that one of the tools as i've introduced is zero loss there are many other tools out there but that was one i wanted to introduce you to um, and so I'll, I'll hand over to gary now Thank you, Daniel. And thank you for unmuting me as well. Uh, reminder to submit your questions for the Q&A function uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, my background before becoming an industrial fellow at Cambridge uh, was 35 years of experience in food and agri-manufacturing, uh, leading technology across 31 factories uh, in UK, Spain, China, and six countries in Africa. Uh, and I'm used to dealing with million tons of raw material, uh, uh, vast flows of energy and water and use of land, uh, and a passion for improvement, innovation and sustainability. Uh, like you said about technology in this space, uh, I'm going to cover uh, how to get people to pay attention, how to involve people across the organization and some of the skills you'll need, which are very widespread indeed, and you may not have them yourself. Uh, the picture on the right hand side, bottom right hand side, is, is, is me uh, in the, my more handsome phase. Um, when my team and I discovered in 2006 uh, that we could make our business carbon neutral. Uh, and at the same time, we could uh, save the planet because we were getting quite enthusiastic about what we were doing. Um, the picture on the left is the ballroom uh, about two sessions later when we got into scope one, two, three emissions, uh, boundary controls uh, uh, and life cycle analysis, uh, we'd lost the momentum and energy. Uh, and that taught me a lot back in 2006 that you need to have more skills than just uh, the technology and the vision to get where you want to get to. Um, so how to get people to, uh, people to pay attention first one is to ensure alignment of sustainability with your key business issues. Um, uh, carbon neutral uh, didn't really do it for my business. It was a bit more uh, uh, esoteric uh, uh, aspect. Uh, as a commodity industry, it was all about driving down costs uh, and ensuring a competitive raw material supply. And as soon as we started to turn the sustainability agenda into the words that the business recognized, we started to get a dialogue with the senior leaders of the business that they could relate to and they could engage with. So we focused on uh, energy, water, land uh, in our sustainability um, uh, narrative um, with knowledge in the background in my, in my mind that carbon neutrality would come, it would take some time, but it's all about starting the journey. So once you start talking the language of uh, the people in the business, you start getting the dialogue uh, and it takes time. Uh, but hopefully you will also get uh, a level of engagement from the senior leadership because it's a big process to start sustainability in your business and without leadership being involved and on board, uh, it's not going to go very far and you'll get frustrated. Um, so how to get people involved across the organization. So basically to get sustainability going, you need to have uh, people involved in your organization uh, and these are the four levels of activity that you can get people to uh, be involved in um, you can level one is about engagement in doing better just now number two is about being technical number three is about a big investment and four is innovation and i'm going to go through those um, uh, one by one um, because you have to get an invo organization involved in all four activities So I'm going to go through them each in, in each turn um, and, and spend most time on the one and four, which tend to be the ones that get um, not used as much in many organizations. Um, so number one is get the most out of what you have now, um, often termed continuous improvements or CI, uh, minimal investment, uh, very popular with the chief financial officer um, and if you go to your finance department and say you can improve the business without much investment you're going to make new friends um, you then need to engage um, the people on the shop floor who are hands-on with uh, with with running the business now 
speak the language. Um, and I've seen some startling um, results in terms of uh, when you look across benchmarks across the same sector, a 500% difference in performance uh, in the same sector uh, is what I found. Uh, I actually went to Cambridge after I found out from my industry and asked them, uh, was, was that normal? Uh, and Cambridge helped me to benchmark benchmarking. Uh, and we found for many, many sectors that 500% actually is a rule of thumb. It appears in many, many sectors. Um, and also the opportunities are somewhere between 20 and 50% uh, improvement. Um, uh, in quite a short period of time. Uh, but there are some methods here. Um, I can't do justice to it on this slide. We, we have a resource efficiency framework in Cambridge, which uh, takes businesses through step by step how to achieve you know, getting most out of what you have now. Um, but an example on the right hand side is a picture uh, from a workshop I ran in Africa. It could easily be UK or Spain. Um, it's not just Africa the where this works. Uh, these are guys who are coming up with 30 actions to improve their business uh, in the current state. Uh, and they made some big steps in, 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 in the first year. Um, there's two guys not in picture who from the, were from the head office technical department. Uh, and they said two things uh, uh, before I, well, actually, I, I ushered out the room before they said these things, uh, but I didn't, didn't want them in the room. Uh, one of the guys said of the 30 actions, 10 were wrong. Uh, and the other guy said, uh, uh, those 10 actions also aren't in the model, so they can't be right. Uh, what was interesting with those two uh, comments, uh, it showed how technical people can, can, can turn off engagement. Uh, the guys in the team worked out six weeks later that 10 other actions were wrong, and they moved them into another 20 actions that were right. But they had control and they had the momentum. They didn't need to be told 10 were wrong, they found it out themselves. Um, and so the guy that about, uh, he, he ran his life through the model, uh, you often and almost, almost, almost never can write life in the model. Uh, many of the actions don't appear in models because life's not like that. Um, number two, uh, Daniel has mentioned some of the things about getting technical. Uh, we have probably have some very technical adept people uh, in the audience today. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on this one because in my experience technology has never been a barrier. Um, it's always been a facilitator. Um, when we need technology it, it tends to step in um, and, and do its job. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, Ian can you move on to the next slide? So then it's about big steps, the small steps uh, uh, we, we've taken on the, third, the previous slide. Um, big investment is often an easy way out. Uh, it has its place. Um, you're going get, to get a hard time in terms of getting the confidence in the returns to ensure you've got the credibility to deliver the project. Uh, and believe me, uh, when you get into project management, uh, on the right hand side, the last webinar is the Whistenton biorefinery. Um, just one aspect of that, the, the bioethanol plant, which is a small subset had 15,000 kilometers of pipe work. Um, and if you lose yourself in that, your sustainability program is gonna come off the rails. So uh, make sure you've got some good management and delivery skills in your teams. Um, but investment is has to be earned and it can be an easy way out. Uh, you won't be a friend of the Chief Financial, financial Officer if uh, you go heavy with that one. And number four is the innovation. Um, uh, it's about how can you transform your business to have no waste to be sustainable. Uh, in the previous webinar, we talked about Whistenton, the hub and spoke model uh, on the bottom right hand side. Uh, if you want to find out more about that, please ask. Um, but there's two things here. Uh, are you thinking two dimensional just inside your own sector or three dimensional across sectors? Because one company's waste is another company's uh, raw material to make products. Um, and by joining the dots together, uh, we can have a no waste bio economy. Um, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, and you have to have partners. Uh, the other aspect about innovation is um, innovators can be seen as weird and wacky. Um, uh, if you come across in that manner, you are not going to get backed. Um, to, you, you might get the first meeting, but if you, you haven't got the ability to deliver on your innovation, um, it's not going to go very far. You have to make innovation safe. 
Um, and if people trust you and you take them in small steps, you mitigate the risks, um, then it's safe and people will take the steps. Uh, and that sugar factory that I, I spoke about last time that started with sugar and finished with medicinal cannabis and was no waste. Um, to some people it's crazy, uh, to the business that invested, it wasn't crazy, it was business sense uh, and it was safe. Can you move on to the next slide, Ian? So we've got the business aligned with sustainability, uh, leadership on board. You've got people involved in the four levels of uh, uh, activity, uh, but that's not enough. Um, the, the two things you must do is track your results to the bottom line, uh, whatever your bottom line is measured by. Uh, and that friend you made uh, in activity one, the chief financial finance officer is a, is a great friend now to pick up again because the finance team are marvelous at, uh, at measuring results. Uh, and if you can get them to measure the output of your activity, it's independent to your, your teams uh, and it's much more effective in the boardroom uh, in, and in the company. Uh, the other one that engineers and scientists uh, uh, are not very good at is talking about your success stories. Um, so make uh, a friend of the communications department. Uh, they're marvelous, they want to tell your story and people like to feel part of a positive journey. Uh, so basically, uh, there's not much in that uh, se section about how to engage your business in sustainability, uh, but there is in fact an awful lot because you've got to track uh, and you've got to tell. And before that, you've got to align and involve. Um, so good luck, all of you. Uh, we have quite a lot of experience at Cambridge to help you. Uh, I'm now going to hand back to, to Steve to, to finish the presentation. The story I really liked in there, if you if you run a factory that thinks it's got an 80% yield, you probably don't measure it because you probably imagine it would be 79% or 78%. And the best way to improve your yield is to do something about the 20% that is the waste, that is the cut waste, right? So you think you're dealing with the technical problem because you've never bothered to bloody measure it. When you go and weigh what's coming in and what's going out and you find out that you're delivering 34%, all of a sudden you've got something to go for and it's not super technical and difficult to do it. And I think that's really quite revealing and Gary's referred to the 500% number. It's very hard to know how much waste there is in our own place of work. One of the great skills that Lean has taught us is how to see certain types of waste but typically that's labour waste or capital equipment waste, not material energy and water waste. So largely we're taking the devices and techniques of lean, but applying them to very different areas. One of the difficulties is trying, trying to understand how big is the prize here. And one way to do that, or a number of ways have been mentioned. Zero loss analysis will give us a particular form of measuring uh, material yield. Gary has suggested that you could go and compare yourself to, I don't know, the best week or the best day in your own factory and the worst day and compare those numbers. He's hinted about the difference between many factories and the best one in its own sector. And since coming upon this sort of data a long time ago, we've done some studies in this area and the numbers are quite astonishing. It is not unusual for the best factory in a particular sector to be five times better than a bulk of other factories. Five times, not five percent. So we did a study asking the question, what if every factory matched the best in its own sector? It's really quite a difficult study to do. We had to find some really good ones, the best ones, hopefully, and we had to go and measure what was the actual performance of the majority of the rest of the sector. And we asked this simple question, if you pull up everyone's performance 
to the highest. Some companies will not get much better. Some companies will get quite a lot better and some companies will get amazingly better because we're even including the worst and believing that they could potentially become equal to the current best. But in our calculations, we worked out that simply matching current best practice would deliver 24% more profit, 30% more jobs, because material recycling tends to be labor intensive. Remember, doing that while generating 24% more profit, so it's not uh, an expensive task to generate those jobs. And a 9% reduction in greenhouse gases. Those are really good things to do without spending money and hard money on investing in big technology changes. The number three in Gary's four piece formula. So I hope you feel a bit excited about the scale of potential that exists. If you can see waste, if you can see waste either by giving you a number that tells you, wow, there's a lot to go for, or by giving your staff the skills to just go, why are we doing it that way? Then we know that that gets people on the sort of journeys that are described in these sorts of numbers. And we could go on and give other examples. Next slide, please. So I'd like to finish by handing over to Ian and encouraging you in the chat, give us your best numbers. Please tell us a story about the most fantastic improvement that you've made in your place. We'd like to collect them. And good luck. So um, I think the first question I'd like to ask uh, the, the, the is to, um, uh, probably a bit to Daniel, but also probably to everyone else as well, which is beyond the zero loss analysis, are there other uh, tools that you'd recommend uh, in looking to uh, identify waste? And while the speakers have a quick think about that, three questions that are general. One, can we provide links to Steve's study? Two, can we provide recommended reading? And three, can we provide the slide deck? Um, the answers to all of those and the information you need will be uh, sent out to you after after the um, uh, after the webinar. So, uh, gentlemen, um, what other tools? So, I think uh, Gary will will probably agree with me on this. It's not so much about finding the best tool; it's about finding the tool that's best suited to the scenario that you find yourself in and the one that's going to generate the most enthusiasm among the people who want to go and work on the improvement. The tools are there to help get the ball rolling, to help you get the support that you need from management, the investment you need, build enthusiasm among the workforce, but at the end of the day someone's going to have to go and do the job. So I'm a big advocate of tools like Zero Loss Analysis that look at things from quite a high level and put value on tools. Other people would recommend lean type tools that are very much about bottom up, starting actions, getting people seeing success and building momentum that way. Um, you know, you can take other approaches, which is a more technical one where you're doing a lot of analysis before starting to take action. I think Gary and I would probably share the view that one should be careful in doing that. So there are many tools out there, um, and I'm not trying to say that one is necessarily better than the other, although I have ones that I personally like more and have had more success with. Uh, I think it's very much about the human side, and I'll, I'll let Gary come in because I think you know, his, his experience of that will, will be quite useful in terms of answering this question. Yeah, Daniel, I think the human side is vital. Uh, I'm a great advocate and, and supporter of, of Demaic and Lean Sigma. Um, some of the best training I've had in my career was in that in that area to get, to become a green belt. Um, uh, one word of caution: No, it only works if you bring the organisation with you. If you lead with lean uh, dialogue in an organisation that's not ready for it, then you're not going to get the message across. Uh, so, so I would always cover those tools with what's normal to be heard in the organisation and make it uh, 
uh, good for the guys in, in all walks in the business. Um, the other, other tool that is not mentioned in the, in the waste area is value mapping, uh, which we, uh, we teach at, at the IFM at Cambridge, which uh, t helps a business turn its waste into raw materials uh, and products for other people to, uh, to make value from. And that's really about taking missed opportunities and turning them into, into value opportunities. And that's the technique that, that we use at the IFM. Thank you. Um, if I can uh, put another question, um, perhaps a fairly quick one to answer here, which is um, uh, how long does it take to make a, a zero loss yield analysis and how hard is it to get the data? I guess both those questions are a bit um, open ended. <clears throat> so, um, usually a zero loss yield analysis is quick. It's designed to be quick. Uh, when I've gone in and done it with uh, the first two case studies I've given you, it required two days on site to get the high level yield number. And that's the key. If that high level yield number is high, i.e. there isn't much waste, you can stop the analysis there and it, it doesn't take more time. Digging into why that number was so low took follow up work over the the following weeks and months with those factories, although it wasn't a continuous uh, project. Um, the third case study was a student project that took about two weeks. So that might give you an example of people who are less uh, familiar with the, the tools and techniques. Uh, the tool is designed to use existing data to give you that high level yield analysis. So things like it, it's based often off financial transactions because they tend to have good records. And the idea of the tool is that it gives you a yield number without having to put in new data capture systems. So if it's working properly, you shouldn't need to collect more data. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll move on to a slightly broader question, <clears throat> which is um, how broad should uh, a definition of waste be? Um, uh, for example, you know, should we include in thinking about waste uh, time that's wasted or movement waste uh, as well as material. Let me grab this one because I think that the <coughs> analogies, the similarities between the general approach to lean and the approach that we're taking to waste are obvious. And so one of the tools, for example, that we can use to identify waste and remove waste is teaching people how to see waste to begin with. And for those of you who've been through lean training and lean implementation, think about if I asked you the question, what tool did you use? And actually the training where you're given concepts that there is waste of overproduction, waste of movement, waste of inventory, that training, which is then taken directly into the process where you apply that training directly to your place of work, is the tool. There is no special other outside tool. Lean does bring with, with it things like value stream mapping. So there are tools and techniques that are attached to the concept of lean that are used as you get more advanced in your implementation of lean. But to begin with, just learning to see waste is really important. So if you already have that skill, applying it to waste of energy, material and water is good. If you approach lean through trying to be good at reducing waste of energy, lean and water, of course, that's another way of coming at the whole story. And you would end up with waste of overproduction. But whoever asked that question is either a genius for inventing lean or already knew what they were asking. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm going to move on to, uh, to, an, to another question around uh, yield analysis. Um, and that is, um, in, a, in a system where recycling and reuse is uh, uh, already uh, built in, do we need to factor in, when thinking about yield analysis, 
what you can be paid for your waste. So the idea of zero loss yield is to try and keep the analysis as simple as possible. I, I saw another question actually in, in the chat that asked about internal recycling uh, and then external recycling when you're being paid for it. Zero loss looks at all of the waste in a single number and so it includes anything that is um, being recycled and will ignore anything that's being internally recycled because you're effectively treating the, the, the whole factory as a black box and doing a mass balance. That means that if your yield number is high, even when you're considering uh, your recycling as being entirely lost because there is some loss associated with it, then it doesn't matter and so you don't need to spend the time trying to put a precise value on it. If your yield is very low, you know that it's worth chasing the numbers in more detail, and so you can start to factor in things like the value you're getting back on your scrap. Uh, and that was one of the things that we did with the steel factory that thought they had a yield of 80%, and it turned out it was 34. We put in the scrap value, and it turned out that actually it was a fairly small proportion of the total value and so more work needed to be done. Can I be slightly more philosophical and nasty in my answer? Um, recycling is failure, right? It doesn't matter how much money you get for it, it's failure. Let's not recycle stuff. If we can avoid creating it to begin with, clearly we need to have a, an extremely clear yes no answer. If that is totally unavoidable waste, go and recycle it. But too many people find it easy to ignore analyzing what is being recycled. So my philosophical point is that's waste and don't count the money that you get for it because it makes you lazy. And so that's why the high level zero loss number doesn't <clears throat> take that into account to try and drive that philosophy. Thank you. Um, I can move to uh, 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 something more, more in Gary's uh, area. Um, we've got a question about how to effectively get uh, involvement uh, between the different silos that we often find in manufacturing businesses. Um, uh, and in particular, thinking about uh, how that might apply to both marketing at one end, uh, as I would think of it anyway, and supply chain at the other. Uh, Gary, any particular thoughts on how uh, we might engage more with supply chain and with marketing? It comes back to, uh, Ian, that uh, alignment at the start of my slot on the presentation. If you're aligned to the key business drivers of your business or your institution, then you should find that all the functions in your um, business are aligned um, uh, behind those key drivers. If they're not, then they've got a problem themselves and they not, need, not, need not be there. Um, but if you pick the right aligned issue for sustainability to drive through, then you're going to get finance, you're going to get marketing, you're going to get communications, you're going to get technologists uh, and operations, factories, people uh, all partaking. So it's about taking time to get alignment with the key issues. Let me, let me make an observation. The factories where... <coughs> we've seen excellent waste reduction. We have seen enthusiastic groups from my, what might seem to be non-operational functions, people who operate the front desk, the reception, people in marketing, they get to see what's happening and they get to see the enthusiasm and the buy-in from people and they want to join in. So that's spreading out into other functions within the same business seems to be a natural process when something is exciting and positive. But for the same companies, you <coughs> might have world-class supply chain management. My observation is they are finding it incredibly difficult to get the same enthusiasm into the operations part of their suppliers. So I still think that this is a fantastically large problem that we're not dealing with very well at the moment. And I don't have and I'm afraid to say really good case studies and examples where supply chain 
waste reduction has happened at scale. If you have any, please contact us. I'd love to hear about them. Thanks, Steve and Gary. Um, just building a little bit more on that, we've got a question about <clears throat> um, it, whether it's uh, whether there are effective ways to communicate uh, waste reduction um, through to your customers and, uh, and and consumers in order to uh, engage with them or allow them to understand uh, the value that you're creating. Any thoughts on that? I think that uh, I'm, I'm going to make this comment from a slightly different viewpoint. Politicians, politicians believe that industry is efficient and doesn't have this waste. And I'm going to say most of our customers think similarly. So to explain to them that you have all of this loss and waste and you're now doing something about it, their attitude is very often, we expect you to be doing that. So it's actually quite hard to turn this into a winning story. That doesn't mean you can't use it in other more technical environments. So if you're in a B to B environment, these things can become very important. If you want, if your competition for winning an order has rather similar performance to you, this might help you win that order. But in a B to C world, it doesn't seem to make such a difference. Thank you. Just, just, just building on that, Steve, uh, I've also observed within companies that uh, the investment argument gets a lot of credit and lots of fanfare when people move forward by investment. But if you explain to someone you can move forward by 50% or more in efficiency just by engaging what you got, what you got today, it's not such a popular brand to be promoting uh, because it does reflect back on people that you should be doing already. So we need to change that. It needs to be a generous dialogue where we enable people to improve uh, and not criticize them for not doing it already. Uh, and that's, that, that, that's quite a skilled role in facilitation within your own businesses. So just be aware of that one. It's easy to get a fanfare for investment, but hard to get a fanfare for doing the basics right. But we do need to do more of that. Thank you, Gary. Um, and we're, we're coming up to the, the, the end of our time. I, I've got an interesting question that I'd like to, to put out, which is perhaps slightly left field, which is how might we um, apply mapping waste in our schools or perhaps in micro businesses would be another, uh, another way of thinking about it. So one, one of the things that uh, we've been taking, doing is taking school kids with a very small amount of training, teaching people you know, from 14 to about 17, how to see waste and taking them for half a day into a factory. And it's really interesting. It helps them understand the world of factories and it gives them a lot of confidence when they can see something. They're going into a totally foreign environment and they can see waste. And that is, uh, it's a really wonderful thing to see. That's why we've been running programs like that for some time. I have no doubt that they can apply the same thing to their own place where they understand how the systems work in a more detailed manner and I would suggest starting with something like here's the total energy that comes in can you be very clear about the total energy that's used in a useful way so starting with a zero loss analysis and or coming at it by asking people to find show us the energy categorize sets of energy wastes or water or material wastes that you can observe and you can come at it in both ways and I find that young people are actually really good at spotting waste. Thank you and I think we'll, we'll, we'll close on that note. Let's find more young people to get out and uh, help us spot waste um, and uh, I look forward to, um, uh, to seeing that and uh, hopefully those of you who are here who are from the manufacturing sector uh, would like to be bold and brave and engage in that sort of program, in which case do get in touch with us because we are uh, interested to find other uh, manufacturers who are willing to participate and learn from as well as give experience to uh, the next generation.